Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Smith, and I'm chairing the afternoon session at the meeting. Uh, and as part of that, uh, I have the great pleasure to introduce Yoram Rudy as the keynote speaker, speaker of this session. Yoram is the Fred Sayag Distinguished Professor of Engineering, Professor of Biomedical Engineering, Cell Biology, Physiology, Medicine, Radiology, and Pediatrics. <laughs> and the Director of the Cardiac Bi Bioelectricity and Arrhythmia Centre. And if that sounds like a remarkable span of healthcare going from really basic science school to translation, and one that is likely to span scales that go from the molecule right through to the patient, uh, then that would be entirely appropriate. Uh, Yoram is one of the true fathers of cardiac measure of physiological modelling. Uh, people who haven't seen him talk, uh, I think we're very much into a treat today, and one that really is going to span so much of the uh, kinds of scales, function, and aspirations that we see in the BPH. Thank you, Nick, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Steve, for the kind invitation. I'm so glad to be here, and I've learned a lot in the last day and a half. Uh, being wired like this, I feel like a virtual human myself. So. Anyway, what I'll try to do is uh, to take you through an example related to cardiac repolarization of how in my laboratory we try to relate what is happening across scales from the molecular to the whole heart. And the example that I will um, talk about is the molecular basis of cardiac repolarization and in particular the role of one of the potassium repolarizing currents that is IKS, the slow delayed rectifier current. After this is done, I will cross to the clinical realm and give you a clinical example of how we use a method that we developed in the laboratory for non-invasive mapping of cardiac electrical activity, again, in the context of abnormal repolarization. So basically, the approach that we adopted in the laboratory is to try and integrate from the molecular, dynamic molecular structure of an iron channel protein to its function, as a charge carrier across the membrane through the whole cell where it interacts with the dynamic environment of the cell uh, that includes all of the ion channels and transporters, calcium dynamics, and also um, the, some of the regulatory pathways. In particular, we have the chem kinase and beta adrenergic pathway included in our model. And then we go into a multicellular tissue model where the cells are connected through models of gap junctions, and that's where we basically stop. We stop at this scale with modeling. We don't cross into building models of the whole heart. In fact, what we do is we obtain the electrical activity of the heart, not invasively using this method that we have developed and validated and now implemented. This took many years to do. But now we have a method that allow, uh, allows us to map non-invasively the electrical activity of the heart. So in a patient-specific data from the patient is introduced and we use the principles that we learn from the modeling to interpret the data that we obtain from uh, patients. So that has been our approach and philosophy in going from the molecule to the whole heart of a specific patient. And this is the tool that we've used uh, all along, which is a model of the uh, myocyte. And we now have a model of the uh, guinea pig, that was the first one we developed, then the canine, and more recently the human, based on data from 144 non-diseased human hearts. And just very briefly, this is the action potentials, this is the calcium transient. The rising phase, as you all know, depends on the sodium current. It's basically a very robust one current process that has tremendous safety built into it. It's enough to have 11% of the sodium current to still have an action potential. And this is really what you want. You want to get an action potential or not get an action potential in a very robust and stable way. The next depolarizing inward current is the calcium current. And you can see that it has a spike in dome morphology. The spike basically triggers release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to generate the calcium transient. The dome holds the plateau of the action potential against the repolarizing action of two, mostly, 
or basically two, including uh, there is also the sodium calcium, sodium potassium pump and sodium calcium exchanger, but there are two very important potassium currents that take positive charge out of the cell to pull down the action potential best to make the rest and determine its duration and repolarization time course. These are ITR, the rapid delayed rectifier potassium current, and ITS, the slow delayed rectifier potassium current. I'll focus on this current because it's very important for the dependence of action potential duration and repolarization on heart rate. Now, in contrast to this very robust process that depends on one process, this time course of repolarization really depends on multiple processes, that is on the L-type calcium, IKR, IKS, isodium potassium pump, <coughs> sodium calcium exchanger. So it's a delicate balance between multiple currents. And as a result, we have tight control over the time course of repolarization, which we want really what we want in order to be able to adapt to rate changes as we exercise or have an emotional uh, trigger. So when the heart speeds up, it needs to shorten because now you have to fit more action potential into the same time interval. So the way to do that, the way to do this is through accommodation. And you accommodate the action potential through a very delicate balance between inward and outward current, which gives you precise control. However, there's a price to pay, because small changes in any of these currents will lead to abnormal action potential repolarization. Uh, this is a model simulated rate dependence of the action potential. You can see how the action potential shortens as the rate is increased long to short. There are also changes in the morphology and the notch here. This is a model of the epicardial myocyte in the dog, and these are experiments from the myocyte of epicardial, uh, the epicardial area in the dog. And you can see the correspondence between model and experiment is quite good. This is a summary of the adaptation curve. As you decrease the cycle length and increase the rate, you start to shorten the action potential duration, especially in the physiological range of rates, and you can see that the dots, the experiment, fall on the um, simulated curve using the uh, myocyte model. One more thing to bring us all to the same page is the relationship between repolarization and the ECG. The QT interval on the ECG between the QRS, which is the activation, reflects activation of the ventricles, to the T wave, which reflects repolarization of the fluid, is proportional or is reflective of the action potential duration. So if QT interval on the ECG, body surface ECG, is prolonged abnormally, that means that there are action potentials in the heart that are, have abnormal action potential duration. If it's very long, these people are at risk of sudden death, they have arrhythmias, and this is what you all know is called the long QT syndrome. And the long QT syndrome could be hereditary or could be acquired because of drug use. So the first example that I would like to show you, and I'm using this as an example in a paradigm, and of course this paradigm and approach can be used for any uh, ion channel. The first one is subunit interaction determines IKS participation in cardiac repolarization and repolarization reserve. Why IKS? Well, IKS plays a crucial role in action potential adaptation to rate changes, as I already alluded to. Mutations in its molecular subunits, KCNQ1, its alpha subunit, and KCNE1, its beta subunit, cause the long QT1 and long QT5 respectively. So there is a hereditary long QT syndrome that is inherited through mutation in the IKS channel structure. LQT1 is the most common long QT syndrome with arrhythmias occurring under high beta adrenergic tone. So these people really suffer arrhythmias and many of them will die during a bolus of beta adrenergic stimulation, either to emotional stress or exercise. IKS is also subject to beta adrenergic regulation in a direct fashion. 
I, and, and importantly, for the modeling effort that I'll show you, KCNT1 is highly homologous to KV1.2. KV1.2 is known as the Shaker Channel. It has been crystallized by Rod McKinnon, who got the Nobel Prize for it. And therefore, if they are highly homologous in structure, then we have a good template to start building on the computer a structure for KCNQ1, which I'll show you uh, later. So what is the mechanism of shortening the action potential duration as rate is increasing? What is the mechanism of adaptation? The mechanism and the concept were borrowed from experiments in the guinea pig. And a word of caution, we have to be very careful about species differences because species are very different in many aspects. And so the mechanism in the guinea pig is the following. This is at slow rate, the yellow. This is at fast rate, and you see the shortening of the action potential. And if you look at IKS current that plays a role in adaptation, you'll see that in the blue curve here, there is an instantaneous jump of current. Okay, instantaneous, when you, when you excite the cell, you get an instantaneous jump in IKS current. That means the channels are sitting there open, waiting for voltage to pass current. So what happens is at fast rate, you pace fast, or the heart beats fast, then channels don't have sufficient time to deactivate and close, and you can catch some of the channels in the open state, and therefore you have an instantaneous jump in current. That is the concept. And therefore you have larger current, more repolarizing current, shortens action potential duration. That doesn't work in large mammals and the human, including the human. In large mammals, including the human, you can see that there is no or very little instantaneous jump in current, and therefore the concept falls apart. And that was not known. And once it was discovered, it was not clear how IKS participate in adaptation. In fact, some people said IKS is not important. But we know it's important because if people have the long QT syndrome, LQT1, which is a mutation in IKS, they die. So it has to be important. So we decided that maybe we can resolve this puzzle or solve this puzzle with modeling. And so the structure, first of all, of IKS is the following. There is KCN1, KCNQ1, the alpha subunit. And of course, like all channels, it has the S4 voltage sensor domain that is positively charged uh, with arginine uh, residues. So when you apply voltage on the memory, it will move up and somehow pull on the power domain, mechanically interact with the power domain to allow it to open. So that's activation. S4 going up, transferring to the pore domain mechanical activity to make this pore domain open and the channel conductive. Four of these are making a tetramer, and this four tetramer channel, KCNQ1 alone, is a functional channel that conducts current. But it's not IKS yet. In order to be IKS, it bounds or it combines with the beta subunit, KCNE1, also known as mean K, and together they form IKS. The consensus is, and it's still debatable, that four of these combine with two of these to form the IKS channel. Now, what, does, what is the current looking like? Well, these are KCNQ1 IV curves alone, and this is human IKS IV curves. And you can see several differences. First of all, KCNQ1 activates very fast. You can see the slope here. In contrast, human IKS activates slowly. This is true for the dog and all large mammals. More importantly, forget this hook, but more importantly, deactivation or closure of channels is slow in KCNQ1, but very fast in IKS. On the surface of it, seemingly, this works against the participation of IKS in rate-dependent adaptation. Because what you want is to catch channels in the open state. Here, in KCNQ1, you can always check, catch some channels. If you pace closer and closer, you still have open channels. 
But if you look here, because deactivation and closure of channels is so fast, even if you get very close to the previous action potential, you cannot catch channels in the open state, which is the understood mechanism in the guinea pig. So this really works against you. The modulation by beta subunit casing one seem to work against you. You'll see that it's not, but it seems to work against you, or at least against the concept of how action potential duration adaptation occurs. So this is not good. Also, slow activation is not good. It's better to catch channels in the open state and activate them fast, according to the guinea pig um, uh, notion. Another thing that works against you, seemingly, is the fact that there is a long delay before the channel activates. See, voltage is applied here. There is still like 50 or 60 millisecond delay before you start to see current. That means that S4, the voltage sensor, and you can show this in the back of the envelope computation, small calculation, simple calculation, S4 has to go through at least two, at least two conformational changes before the channel opens. That's the time that it takes to get here. So, yeah, this starts to move up, the channel doesn't open, only after it goes through several transformations and several changes, the channel can open. That is the delay for channel opening. And indeed, there is biological evidence for those transitions. Uh, this is from Diane Papazian laboratory, and she showed the uh, biological basis of interaction between the different um, sections of, of this channel, that there is a resting position of the voltage sensor domain, okay, which is deep closed state of the channel, then there is an intermediate state, then there is an activated state, and only when all four voltage sensors of all domains in the tetramer, only then the channel can open. Well, only four of them have to be in the activated state. So we went through a simple calculation here of all the combinations and all the permutations that can happen. So here is the channel when all voltage sensors are in the deep closed state. Okay? Then one of them can go to the intermediate state. From here, this one can go to the activated state, but another one can go to the intermediate state and so on. And if you do all of those, and you count them, you'll have 15 closed states before the channel can open, because all of them have to be in the green activated state. So we built a Markov model to simulate this. And let me just mention that you can see how a Markov model can already have some basis in the channel structure, right? Because this tells you about the dynamics of the channel structure while the channel is opening two stages of movement of the voltage sensor, and we take into account all of these states okay, in a Markov model, and this is the Markov model that we've built. And in order to duplicate all of the experimental data, both published and data that we obtained from several of our collaborators, we had to make this transition here, in this direction, the horizontal transition among the uh, green states, an order of magnitude slower than transition in the vertical direction. Okay, so the transition rate here is 44, but here it's 4.4. So these transitions are slow and these transitions are fast, which identifies immediately these states here as privileged. Because channels that are in any one of these states, all they have to do is go through one fast transition before opening. So they are available to open very fast on demand. But if a channel has enough time to cross back to any one of the green states, it's, it's lost. Because now to come back, it takes a long time on a slow transition. So this is what we call the available reserve of channels that can open if needed on, on demand. This is just to show that you know, the, this model with 15 closed state really duplicates all of the experiments. These are the experiments and these are the results of those experiments. The dots are experimental data and the lines are model simulated with this model. Here is some more of those. And again, you can see that for 
uh, the human IKS, there is really very fast deactivation and closing of channels, so you can never capture channels in the open state, or very unlikely. While here, in the guinea pig, deactivation is slow enough, so you can always catch channels in the open state. So the concept here makes sense, but it doesn't when you look at the human or the dog. So now, we can do what modeling can do, of course, and take this fifth enclosed state based on structure um, Markov model and introduce it into the cell model to see what it does in physiological conditions. And we can introduce IKS or we can introduce KCNQ1 without the beta subunit and see the difference. And here is IKS at two rates, slow rate and fast rate. You can see the shortening. Here is IKS at slow rate and fast rate, and you see that there is almost no accumulation in the open state, almost no instantaneous jump. But what jumps at you is the fact that the slope here is much steeper than the slope here. So the current grows much faster at fast rate than it grows at slow rate. And how does it work? Well, it works this way. You can look with this model, of course, you can look at the population of the different states of the model, and you can see here, at slow rate, what happens. This is the open state inhabitants, or the open state population, okay? And you can see during an action potential, there's increase in the open state, and then goes back to baseline. Transition occurs first to the blue states, zone one of privileged available reserve states, and then slowly transition from this state to the green states where it's basically lost for a long time because of the slow transition. That's what happens at slow rate. You end up with all of the states in the green zone two of states that are far away, kinetically far away from the open state. Not in the blue states that are kinetically close to the open state. In contrast, at fast rate, there is not enough time for channels to go back from the blue states to the green states. Remember, these are slow transitions. So, yes, the open state goes back to baseline, so there is no accumulation in the open state and no instantaneous current, or very little, but channels are kept up here in the blue states, available, ready to open on, reserve, on, on demand. And they don't have enough time between beats to cross to the green state where they're lost. That's the mechanism. The mechanism is that now channels can open very fast from the available reserve on every beat at fast rate. And the rate of growth of the current is faster at fast rate than at slow rate. And this is exactly what you want. You want to maximize your current late during the action potential, during the critical repolarization phase, where there is, as I said, a delicate balance of current that controls repolarization, and therefore any small change in current will have a tremendous effect. So you don't want to accumulate open states here, because here it will be wasted. First of all, it's far away from the repolarization phase. Second of all, it will work against a tremendous overwhelming sodium current. It will be wasted. What you want to do is keep the current, conserve the current, and allow it to grow faster so that it reaches its peak exactly where it's needed. So it's a very clever mechanism. Much better than accumulating in the open state. The guinea pig can live with that, but humans apparently can't. And they need a more conservative mechanism that will allow the current to maximize where it's needed. This is just a, an interesting uh, story. I, I was in a meeting in Zeged in Hungary of the European Ion Channel community. And Antonio Zaza, who is from uh, Milano, Italy, showed me his experimental data. And he said, Joram, I can't understand this. We have this reproducible. We did it many times. We have no accumulation at fast rate. This is fast rate. This is slow rate. There is no accumulation and no instantaneous jump at fast rate but the current grows faster. I said, I think I know the answer, because at that time we were doing those simulations. Went home, simulated this protocol, and you can see the correspondence exactly the same. Almost no accumulation in the open state, 
but the current grows faster at faster rate than it's slower. And that has an important implication to our rhythmogenesis. The important implication is the following. This here is KCNQ1 in the cell. Okay, so this is the action potential of KCNQ1. You can see that there is accumulation right here on the rising phase of the action potential of, IK, of KCNQ1 current. And by then it cannot grow anymore. So it stays flat. In contrast, here there is almost no accumulation in the open state. This is human IKS. But the current grows faster to have a much larger maximum current exactly where it's needed during the repolarization phase and shorten the action potential much more effectively. You can see the adaptation curve with human IKS is much steeper than the adaptation curve with KCNQ1 alone. And for arrhythmias, well, you know, the notion of repolarization reserve is that IKS provides repolarization reserve when IKR is compromised. IKR can be compromised by drugs or by mutation in long QT2. Long QT type 2 is because of mutations in IKR, the other repolarizing current. When it's compromised, IKS takes over. Right? The problem is that it doesn't always work. I'll show you here for, again why it's important to have the IKS dynamics versus the KCNQ1 dynamics. The gray is the cell with KCNQ1. The black is the cell with IKS. You can see that if we block IKR, such as, you know, a lot of drugs block IKR, and not all of them are cardiac drugs. For example, antipsychotics will block IKR, some antibiotics will block IKR, and in fact, there is a polymorphism in the black population in the United States, and that polymorphism in IKS compromises somewhat IKS, and these people have a large um, degree of sudden death, of it means in sudden death, when they take IKR blocking drugs such as antibiotics. They don't affect the rest of the population because the rest of the population have a, an IKS that is adequate to be repolarized in reserve. But if your IKS is, is, is compromised even by a polymorphism, right, then this population is in danger. So IKS can overcome the situation. You can see here that KCNQ1 alone, which is wasted, as I said, by opening early, if KCNQ1 is in the system, then there is secondary depolarization here, known as early after depolarization. And this early after depolarization can be a trigger of cardiac arrhythmias. It's known. So without the modulation from the beta subunit, without the IKS properties, but KCNQ1 alone, the cell will develop an early after depolarization, which is an arrhythmogenic trigger. But if we have IKS in the system, it can overcome, because it maximizes its current here, exactly where it's needed, to overcome this difficulty and resume normal repolarization. That's the importance of this part. Okay, let me skip this and cross the barrier to the molecular level. There are limitations to the existing computational methods, and I think we all know that Hodgkin-Huxley formulation fits macroscopic current through an ensemble of many channels. It cannot simulate single channel current and does not reflect the molecular structure of an ion channel. In fact, if you know, you know the, the sodium current is n to the 3H. M is activation parameter, H is an inactivation parameter. They're multiplied, that means they're independent. But we know that they're not, because mostly sodium channels inactivate from the open state. So there is coupling between activation and inactivation. That's not part of the Hodgkin-Huxley formulas. Hodgkin-Huxley formulas have had tremendous contribution to our field, of course. But it has its limitations. Remember that at the time, Hodgkin Huxley did not know that there were single channels. They assumed there were. They never saw them. They didn't know anything about their structure, so they had <coughs> tremendous scientific imagination. But 
Now we know the limitations because we have much more data on the molecular scale. So this channel, the, the Hodgkin-Huxley approach is macroscopic. It computes macroscopic current through an ensemble of channels. Markle models represent kinetic states of the channel, but not its actual structure and molecular dynamics during viewing. So, Markle models go one step further. As I showed you, we can somehow identify the Markle states with some structural properties. But still, first of all, Markle models are not unique. You can have infinite number of Markle models that you will duplicate the experimental data, so it's not unique. And number two, the states, C1, C2, C3, those states that I talked about, are kinetic states. They are abstract kinetic states. They are not the real conformational structural states of the channel. So now, the next step is what we have done was to develop a computational methodology for truly relating molecular structure to function in the context of whole cell electrophysiology and the action potential. It can be used to study mutations, drug binding, because you can now bind a drug anywhere in the structure, and so on. And the first example is, again, IKS. That's what we've been concentrating on. But again, this is a paradigm that can be used for all other um, ion channels. Again, this is the cartoon of the structure that I showed you before, and what we currently have on our computer is this detailed structure of the IKS channel. It has all of this, I can really cannot uh, go through this in detail, sufficient to say that serine 27 here on the end terminus of this uh, channel protein, this serine 27 is the location of phosphorylation during beta adrenergic stimulation, PKA phosphorylation happens here. Uh, the gray is calmodulin that is tethered to the channel. KCNE1 is shown to dock into KCNQ1 right here. This is this purple thing. Okay. This is a side view. This is a top view of the tetramer showing how the four subunits are forming the pore. So we have a detailed model of the structure now. And in fact, the structure that I show here is one of a library of about one million structures that are permissible. And we have a library of about a million structures that IKS can assume during its dynamics. I'll show you a movie of the channel gating, if you can click on this. The movie shows only, only essential parts of the ion channel protein. It doesn't show all of the detailed molecular structure, but it shows a reduced structure that is essential for seeing, otherwise it's very difficult to see. You can see here the voltage sensing domain, which is S3 and S4. It moves up and down with voltage and pulls through this S5, S, S4, S5 linker to open or close the channel. This will indicate, indicate a closed channel, this will indicate an open channel. So now we apply a voltage pulse, and you see that the voltage sensor is trying to go up, and it pulls on the pore domain and changes its structure, but it doesn't open yet. That's the delay that I showed you. We just exposed this structure to the existing uh, forces in the, in the system, electrostatic, van der Waals, and a stochastic force field. So that's the delay, we're already here. Now we jump to about 50 milliseconds. Now you start to see some flickering and opening of the channel. You see how the voltage sensor is up here. And as time goes by, this becomes longer and longer opening and shorter and shorter um, episodes of closed channels. Okay? That's towards the end. And now if you take a thousand, or you do this thousand times, you'll start to see an activation curve that looks like the activation curve of the macroscopic ensemble current. Okay, so now we basically connected from the, um, from the molecular structure and its movement during gating all the way to the activation curve of the macroscopic current. 
I, I, I should make one statement. This is all stochastic. So if I do it again, okay, the channel will go through another trajectory from closed to open. So there are infinite trajectories. I showed you one, but there are infinite trajectories. And I think this goes back to Dennis Noble opening talk about uncertainties and about stochasticity. And I think the fact that it is stochastic is key to our existence. Just imagine that every ion channel in your body has to go through exactly the same trajectory like a Swiss watch every time it activates under adverse conditions such as fever and all kinds of very broad you know, changes in metabolism and so on. This is impossible to ask from a Swiss watch to endure all of those uh, conditions and still be uh, reliable. So I think the key to our existence, the big secret is the fact that we don't have precise mechanisms, that the mechanisms have built in range and freedom and, um, and this whole stochasticity of processes to be able to have errors, have noise, have stochastic processes going and still produce the correct function. Okay, so once we have, once we have the structure, we can move it through its gating mo motion as I showed you, and we can compute the energy at every step while the channel is gating and opening. And this will produce an energy landscape. What you see here is the energy landscape in two degrees of freedom. The voltage sensor shown here in green can go up and down as I showed you and it also rotates if you noticed in the movie. So we show rotation and we show translation and we compute the energy stepwise as it moves. And the, the, the uh, colors here are energy levels. You can see immediately that you have three minima. When we saw that, we jumped for joy, because that tells you that there are two voltage sensor transitions before the channel can open. This is the deep closed state, then it can go to the intermediate state, and then to the activated state. As you know, the minima are locations, the energy minima are locations of stable conformations or metastable conformations. So it can be in a deep flow state, intermediate state. So that's consistent with the Markov model and the structure, as I showed you before. We then, if I can have this movie, I'll show you the, the movement of the voltage sensor together with the movement of a ball on the energy landscape. And you'll see how the structure is related. This shows just the voltage sensor domain and we're rotating to show the structure at every stage. So this is one. Now it goes from the activated to the intermediate. The voltage sensor green goes down, R4 goes down, and now we're in this minimum. Now it'll go down again, and this is the next minimum, which is the deep close state. And if we put voltage on the membrane, you can see that at minus 80 millivolts, most of the minima migrated to the deep closed state as expected. While at plus 60 activated, most of the minima migrated to the activated state. You still have stable situations here and here, but they're much reduced. And so that's another concept that we need to take with us. That is, people talk about in depolarizing potentials, channels are open, and at repolarized potentials, channels are closed. It's not true. They can be closed during, active, during depolarized potentials or open at repolarized potentials. It's just a question of probability. The probability will be much higher that at depolarized plus 60 channels will be here, while at repolarized minus 80 channels will be here. So it's probability stochastic again, not open or closed, but we, we, you know, we, we sort of grew up thinking of channels being closed at the polarized potential open at the polarized potential. They can be either way, except the probability changes. Then we can have all four voltage sensor domains and do a Monte Carlo simulation on, all, on each one of them. And then when all balls, so to speak, on those energy landscape are in the activated states, 
for here, 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 and here, then the channel can open. That gives us single channel traces. You can see here single channel traces. By the way, IKS single channel traces were not available when we did this because it's very difficult to measure, it's very small current. But more recently in Canada, uh, Shimoni, they measured uh, single current currents and they look exactly like this with all the statistics feeding their statistics of the measurement. Then we added up 1,000 of those channels and we obtained, you can see here, exactly what looks like the KCNQ1 activation curve that I show you in the beginning of my talk. And then I asked my uh, colleague and neighbor next door, Dr. Jinmin Sui, to experimentally measure currents expressed in the frog oocyte, in the frog egg. And you can see in black his measured currents and in blue our simulated currents starting from the channel structure. This is the wild type. You can recognize now the energy landscape of the wild type. This is a mutation called E160Q. E160 is a glutamic acid on S2. It's negatively charged. Okay? So there is an interaction between the S4 arginines that are positive and this glutamic acid on S2 to stabilize the channel. But if we replace this glutamic acid by a neutral, non-charged residue, but polar, this one is non-charged, neutral, and non-polar, so the severity of the replacement is increasing in this direction, and finally, it's replaced by K, which is positive. So here, there is not only there is no attraction to stabilize the channel, but there is repulsion because they're both positive. And look at the energy landscape. This minima starts to reduce, reduce, and here, there is no stable state. There are no minima. When we look at the current that Dr. Sui has measured experimentally, you can see how the current is reduced as you go from wild type to increasingly more severe mutation. And the model, starting from the structure, duplicates the experimental behavior very nicely. In fact, you know, you see, you look here, it's the first time that I saw that, exper that the model will give you more jagged traces than the experiment. This is because we only add up stochastic 1,000 channels. If we had a million of them, it'll be as smooth as the experimental measurements. This, by the way, is a clinically occurring mutation, and it's the most severe LQT1 mutation known clinically. And you can see there is no stability and there is no current, and it explains the severity of the clinical mutation. Now this is where experiments end, but we can continue and compute the action potential, and you can see that at slow rate, from red, which is the wild type, to the most severe uh, blue mutation, there is increase in action potential duration, long QT syndrome, and at fast rate, there is much less increase. That's really the signature of the long QT syndrome. It prolongs the QT interval preferentially at slow rate. Here is the adaptation curve, almost no prolongation at fast rate, but great prolongation at slow rate, and here is the QT interval on the ECG that we can compute. It's a, 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 a pseudo-ECG from the tissue model, and you can see the prolongation of the QT interval from here to the blue. Okay, let me, if you can give me one, two more minutes, then I'll do the ECGI part of it also, because I think that's illustrating. Thank you. Okay, so um, crossing to the clinical realm, as I said, the, the danger in, in repolarization abnormality is that you have very sharp gradients of action potential duration. Let's assume that you have a region with long action potentials and a region with short action potential or normal action potential, and there is a trigger here, let's say an EAD, early after depolarization that I showed you, then it cannot penetrate the region of long AP because this is still recovering and cannot be excited. So it'll go around and around and around, and then re-enter, because it will be now recovered when it gets here, and will form a closed loop. And this closed loop is known as re-entry or re-entrant loop, and it becomes an oscillator and a driver 
that captures the heart and causes the arrhythmia. That's the mechanism and that's the danger of abnormal repolarization. So what we've done to see this in patients is developing this method very quickly. We measure 250 electrocardiograms. We push the patient through a CT scan. So we obtain not only the potential distribution every millisecond on the body surface, but also the heart torso geometry from the CT scan. And then we develop and validate it over many years the algorithms and, and, and physics and mathematics of this whole thing to combine the two. And what comes out of it are potentials and electrograms and activation sequences non-invasively on the heart. It approximates closely what you would have measured if you were to open the chest, put a sock with a thousand electrodes on the heart. Okay? So we have a possibility similar to MRI or CT, but for electrical function. And we've done this in normals. The QRS, as I said, the QT interval reflects the action potential duration. In normal hearts, right ventricle has no action potential duration of 225 milliseconds, and the left, 265. So there is 40 milliseconds gradient from right to left over a very long distance. So it's a shallow gradient, and there is no danger for the development of reentry. In contrast, this is a story of twin brothers. One of them died at the age of 19. You can see his twin brother came to us when he was 21 for this ECGI test. You can see that his QRS is not normal. It has this slurring of the QRS. Frighteningly, his twin brother who died has exactly the same ECG. It's quite amazing how those ECGs are exactly the same. They both have what's known as early repolarization syndrome. That's why this brother died. This brother survived because he has an implanted defibrillator that fired many times before it came to us at 21. All right. So we look to see what's happening at his heart, why you have deflections here where normally it goes straight down. This could be due to late activation or early T wave, early repolarization. And so we did that, and these are, of course, I said these are identical twins, and their ECGs are identical, and this is a hereditary disorder. And so here, the heart of this particular person, conduction, activation, these are shown activation sequences, is completely normal and smooth, there are no lines of block, no slow conduction. But when we look at repolarization, we saw a whole region here, right here, whole region of very short action potentials. The action potential duration there was 140 millisecond compared to 235 normal. Okay, so it's almost 100 millisecond abbreviation. And there is an extremely large repolarization gradient that is very arrhythmogenic because of this block and reentry. It's 107 millisecond per centimeter compared to normal 11 millisecond per centimeter. We also caught premature beats that were triggering beats, presumably from early after depolarizations, as I showed you. And you can imagine if a beat that is started here in this location hits this region here of steep gradient at the right time, the right orientation, and the right direction then it will generate a re-entry loop and an arrhythmia and sudden death can ensue unless, you know, this guy had an implanted device that prevented it. So again, probability. We all have substrate that can develop arrhythmias, but these people have a substrate that really increases their uh, probability of developing a re-entrance circle cycle that can cause an arrhythmia and sudden death. And at that, I'll Thank you all for your attention. So we're a little bit late coming back from lunch, but uh, I'd like to thank Yoram for an absolutely fantastic lecture. And we have time for perhaps a couple of quick questions. Very interesting talk. Um, I have one question um, concerning the stochasticity. We you stress several times in your talk how important it is to take into account the stochasticity. I was wondering if you consider a single ion channel, for example. Of course, it's important to say 
uh, it opens and closes with a certain rate and it's open with a certain probability. But if you have a whole example, uh, ensemble, and then it gives the ensemble is huge, then you can very well uh, calculate with expectation values. Right? So it looks to me that um, the stochasticity becomes particularly important if you have very rare events that are stochastic. Yeah. I, d I don't think I heard you very well. I'm sorry. It's, my hearing is not so good. But if, if I understood your question, you're asking about there is a huge ensemble of channels. Right? And, and, and it's all a probabilistic approach. I, here, here, here is the way we compute the current. I'm sorry. No, oh no, that was not the main point. So the main point was that um, if you have a large ensemble, which you do have because you have many ion cha channels. Many ion channels. Yeah, then um, you can, in the end, you can calculate with, the, with expectation with you quite well. Because the curve will be smooth, but, but if you have very rare events, then stochasticity becomes really important because then you, you see the spikes in, in, in the sense. And uh, in, in the case with, this, with ion channels, it doesn't seem to be so important because you have so many. On the average, it's true. But if you want to connect, you know, there are two ways to compute the, the current. We can, com we can build a Markov model and then compute the transition rates between states in the model that we created from the energy landscape. That will give us single channel current. And that's very meaningful because you want to really relate for example, we can bind a drug to serum 27, allow the channel to move through its trajectory, see how it changes the, the movement, the open state, and then the current, the action potential, and so on. The other approach is, as you um, alluded, is to take directly compute, directly compute from the structure the open probability of the channel. That way you bypass the single channel Markov model. There is no need to assume a Markov model because a Markov model is not unique. But you pay a price. The price is that now you don't have single channel currents and you immediately compute the open probability, which is the ensemble current. So it's a trade-off. And, and of course we do both. And you have to make sure that if you add up a million channels or a thousand channels from the single channel approach and compute directly the ensemble current, both have to be exactly the same, so it's a good point for validation. Okay, I'm gonna, we're going to have two very short questions, and then we'll... Uh, uh, in one of your first slides, you, you showed the various scales, uh, going to the whole, uh, whole arc, but I didn't, see, I didn't see anything related to, say, regulation, and I, there are thousands of regulatory mechanisms out there, and I found it interesting that you can make all these predictions without actually taking into account any of those explicitly. Um, can you comment on that? Uh, we, as I said, we don't really, I had a short discussion with Dennis before, but, you know, we do a lot of this, uh, as I showed in the, in the first slide, our philosophy in, in the lab is to really use uh, models that we can have strong confidence that we know exactly what they do and we know exactly how to uh, justify the assumptions that lead to these models. We all make assumptions when we put models down. And so what happens is that we stop at a level that we feel comfortable enough, which is the level of the tissue, two-dimensional, at most three-dimensional tissue, where we have um, an accurate model of the cell, as accurate as we can be, and also of the structure distribution of gap junctions between cells and so on. We stop there, okay? We don't have models of the whole heart. What we do for the whole heart, we image the electrical activity of whole hearts in patients. And we use the principles that we learned from our modeling efforts to interpret the data in the patient's imaged electrophysiology. Now, I'm very hesitant about trying to develop a heart that is a model of a specific patient's heart because there is huge variability and much unknown about that particular heart. Certain things can be obtained, fiber orientation, anatomy, but that heart has a very different, you know, two hearts, we've seen now, we've done 
this mapping in thousands of hearts, in thousands of patients. The variability between hearts is tremendous. And it's also time dependent because hearts remodel, especially with abnormalities and pathology, there is huge and fast. The time, the time course of replacement of gap junctions, the half-life is about an hour. So you replace now as many gap junctions as we speak. And so, you know, to, to duplicate a particular heart that has a particular conduction system, especially in pathology, if somebody has a myocardial infarction, you don't know if that uh, conduction system was affected by the infarct or not affected by the infarct. How is it changed by remodeling tomorrow? Uh, what is the distribution and, um, and, and expression level of ion channels as a function of location? In every heart it's different. How do you know and how do you take all of those parameters that are crucial for arrhythmias into account and develop and, and, and pose a heart, my heart on the computer? I think our approach is different. We're taking the principles that we learned from the modeling to interpret what we see in the clinic, but we don't duplicate a particular heart because we don't feel we can. Okay, I'm going to convert my two questions into the one long one we've just had and uh, encourage everybody to make the most of your time in the breaks to, to take additional questions offline. Yoram, on behalf of the organisers, uh, they would like to give you this. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you once again for, for a long I was not only invited to Norway, I'm taking Norway home. <laughs> Okay. Oh.